The Human Experience, Inside the Humanities at Stanford University, humanexperience.stanford.edu. But I want to focus here uh, for a second on the broader motivating idea that is sort of standing in the background of the whole argument, this basic premise that desire is a kind of lack. That's a strong assumption about the nature of desire, and I think it has some troubling consequences. So I want to spend about uh, five or ten minutes talking about that. So the idea, again, is that desire is basically a form of lack or need for something. You desire something only because you don't have it, and so as soon as you do have it, then you stop desiring it. This picture makes sense for some central desires. So I'm hungry, and I desire food, and if I get some, then my desire is satisfied, and I no longer want any food. The desire goes away. Same thing for thirst, same thing for scratching my itches, and all kinds of other desires. It's worth noting, I won't make a big deal of it right now, but it's, it's worth noting that this theory works particularly well for animal desires, for desires that are really closely tied to uh, the kind of bodily nature that we share with animals. But it follows from this view that there's no such thing as continuing to want what you have. Once you have it, then you no longer lack it. And since desire just is lack, you no longer desire it either. That consequence is troubling because it's very natural to think that the experience of satisfaction consists in getting what you want. And it's well known that if you get something you want, or anyway, you get something, and then you find out you don't really want it anymore, that's deeply frustrating. So for example, I really, really, really wanted to go to the Lucinda Williams show, but now that we're here, and it's after 11 p.m., and she's still not even out there yet, and everybody's getting drunk, and the drinks aren't even very good, and they're so expensive, well, I'm not really having fun anymore. That's not the experience of satisfaction, that's frustration. Getting what you want, and it's turning out uh, not to be desirable after all. The platonic theory of desire seems to entail that all desire is going to end up this way. Since as soon as you get the thing you've been desiring, it's in principle impossible for you to keep on wanting it. So all desire will end up frustrated or frustrating like the Lucinda Williams concert. Either you want something, but that means you still lack it, and so you're frustrated that way, or you get it, but you no longer want it, and so you're frustrated another way. This was, in fact, uh, a theory of desire that was made fully explicit by a 19th century philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, and he drew the natural consequence, which is that there are only two possibilities in life, pain, that is having the desire and it's unsatisfied, and boredom, that is uh, realizing that you didn't want it in the first place. So life is just a pendulum swinging back and forth between pain and boredom, and so the entire universe is set up for everything to suck. Now, Socrates does make a later concession so that that view that everything sucks, that's known as pessimism. That's the technical philosophical <laughs> word for that, for that view. Socrates does make a later concession on this point. He admits that you can desire continued possession of something that you already have. But that doesn't really concede enough, I think. This sticks with the basic idea that desire is still lack, and now it just focuses the lack on the question of future possession. So I'm worried that about the security of my future possession, or I don't yet have the future possession, so I'm worried about I lack that. And so the basic conception of desire as lack is still uh, intact here. It's still the driver for the desire. But clearly, I think, it's possible for me to continue desiring something that I have, even if it's all about the past. So I desire the friendship that I have with my best friend from college, even though he lives in Chicago, we never see each other anymore, the whole thing is about the past, but it's one of the most important relationships in my life. Here's another example, I'm trying to try to put a sharper point on it for you yourself. Think about you yourself. The time will come for all of you, some of you sooner, some of you later. When you desire the support, the love, the good relationship, which I'm sure you have, which you rely upon with your parents. 
the time will come when you desire that very much, you desire the maintenance of that good relationship, but you do not desire that they stand up in your face all the time and involve themselves in your present and future activities. You want the relationship, you just don't want it to be now. You want it to be then. Right? Okay, so uh, that's a case where you really do want something that you have, this good relationship, even though uh, your concern is not that you'll continue to have it. Your concern is that uh, you do have it. In these cases, we clearly desire what we have, and we desire it not because of some lack or some worry about future possession. We want them because they're good to have, and having them does not make them any less good to have. Now, Plato, of course, could bite the bullet here and just insist that desiring is intrinsically bad, and it shows that we're limited, we're not like the gods, and it would be better to be like the gods and not to be dependent, not to have any desires at all, simply resting in the possession of invariable, constant goods. Maybe that would be something like contemplating the forms. Think again of that picture. But that just shows how deep Professor Taylor's complaint against Plato really is. What's good and satisfying about life, and now I'm talking about our life, not some made-up fantasy life that's immune from any kind of loss or change. What's good about life is precisely that we can want things, and if we luck out and maybe get them, we can then continue to be satisfied because we still want them. Indeed, we can feel blissfully content with our good luck in getting them. Note here that this is perhaps especially true about our love life, where the satisfactions of love often don't depend on our lacking the qualities that we seek. The human experience. Inside the humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu